grab an empty pizza box and a flattened can of lager because this is pillar of garbage and we're back talking about Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. I'm sure at this point I don't need to introduce this show anymore. If you're new here, I'll throw a card on screen with a link to a video I made for this very purpose. But otherwise, let's jump in and look at Series 1 Episode 8, Some Assembly Required, and how it shows the ways that EMH can intelligently update the original Avengers comics. So this is the fourth video I've made on this show, and up until now I've been comparing it mostly to the MCU, to which it has a great number of similarities. But I've also wanted to talk about the ways it interacts with its original source material, and this episode is the perfect opportunity. See, I didn't realise it until I rewatched it recently, but Some Assembly Required is actually a loose adaptation of two stories from the comics, Avengers Issue 2 from 1963 and Avengers Classic Issue 1 from 2007, the latter of which being where this episode gets its title from. The second comic isn't massively important, so I'll really TLDR it. It's basically set in between the first and second issues of the original run, having been written 40 years after the fact, and shows the team trying to have their first meeting and getting to know each other a little, after their inaugural mission against Loki, which I touched on briefly last week, so click this card if you missed that. This story is mainly just a bit of fun, but it does show attitudes and personalities clashing, particularly Thor and the Hulk, and it seems to foreshadow the fact that this initial squad might have some trouble sticking together, but we'll come to that. Avengers issue 2 though is more important. It's called The Space Phantom. To land in this dark alley and change to my natural form, that of the Space Phantom. <laughs> Essentially, what happens here is this weird-looking pointy-haired alien, who has a connection with the dimension of Limbo, decides that he wants to conquer Earth. And so even though they've only existed for like five minutes, this ghost dude realises that he'll have to defeat the Avengers if he wants to defeat Earth. And this phantom from space, who I kid you not is named the Space Phantom, has this power where if he grabs you, he can trap you in Limbo and take your shape and you're only freed when he's bored of your shape and does it to someone else. So this dude decides to infiltrate the Avengers, stealing Hulk's shape and starting beef with the other Avengers, and it works. The Avengers fall out with the Hulk, big time, and even when the Space Phantom swaps to someone else, everyone still has it in for the Hulk. Meanwhile, the Space Phantom's plan seems to be going well, sowing discord among the ranks of the nascent team, until he tries to steal Thor's shape and send him to Limbo. It doesn't work, because apparently you can't do that to Asgardians. As a result, Space Phantom himself ends up trapped in Limbo. All's well that ends well, right? Well, not exactly. Hulk is not happy with his teammates. He noticed how quick they were to turn on him, even after the Phantom had left his body and the things they'd said. So Hulk leaves the team for good. Well, they haven't rejoined the Avengers like 50 years later, but in comic terms, this is pretty much as definitive as you're gonna get. So now we're familiar with the source material that episode 8 is working with, let me tell you the two main things this episode does to modernise and improve upon these comics. The first point is maybe kind of obvious, but it's a point that needs to be made. EMH recognises what works in old, wacky 60s comics and brings it across. With the benefit of hindsight, not everything about the original source material is solid gold, and we'll get onto that shortly. But the EMH team saw in the Space Phantom story a core plot structure and character moments that make sense and work with these five characters, providing drama that works nearly 60 years after the original story was penned. So the episode keeps the infiltration idea, only here is the Enchantress, not the Space Phantom, who gets inside the Hulk and spreads discontent in the team and it keeps the sad way his teammates respond to this trick, a way which reveals they're only too ready to see the Hulk as the mindless monster the rest of the world sees. To illustrate this tension, the show also integrates the Thor-Hulk dynamic from the Avengers classic story I mentioned earlier, and the result is the same as in Avengers issue 2, when Hulk perceives his teammates to still not trust him, or even like him, he leaves. He'll be back, eventually. But the story beat is ripped straight from the pages, and it works, it's a gut punch. It's a lesson in faith. The Avengers learn that for the team to work, there needs to be a baseline of trust and respect. But learning this lesson comes at a heavy price. There's a few other fun moments that are ripped straight from the pages too, like the Avengers showing up late for their meeting, but I encourage you to go back to this comic and spot these for yourselves. Partially because I don't want this video to be like 30 minutes long, but also because it's just quite a fun thing to do. 
But this idea of partial adaptation also brings us to the next lesson. This episode teaches us about the way EMH engages with its source material. Point two is that, yeah, the show takes what works, but maybe more importantly, it fixes what doesn't. This is most obvious when considering Space Phantom himself. Like, come on, do I really have to explain this? Suffice it to say, this is a character with a nonsense backstory, nonsense powers, and a nonsense face. Yes, I am aware that eventually Space Phantom is retconned to be a servant of Immortus, but that's not really relevant to Avengers Issue 2 or the EMH episode. With five decades of hindsight, the writers for this show evidently realised that the only thing that still works about the Space Phantom is the way he can infiltrate this new team and exploit existing interpersonal issues. So they jettisoned the dead weight, kept these aspects, and explored them instead through a character we've already seen in the series, and who will go on to become an important returning villain, the Enchantress. So instead of shape-shifting in limbo, the episode explores the same themes and the same character beats, using an established character and their powers of enchantment. And I'll save an in-depth analysis of the character for the future, but Amora is a great character in the show, well-written and well-performed, so it's just an added bonus that she gets to chew the scenery in this story instead of Space Phantom. The show, then, is not afraid to detonate outdated aspects from the comics, and this is a good thing. This dynamic is actually shown at the very start of the episode too, albeit in a different way. We open with the Avengers taking down Mandrill, one of the escapees from the recent supervillain jailbreak. In the episode, it's mainly played off as a demonstration of how much more effective the Avengers are when they work together, an ironic counterpart to the episode's ending. But there's more going on here. See, Mandrill has a bit of an odd history from a modern perspective. There's a brief reference to it in this episode, but one of his main powers is a sort of pheromonal control, where he's able to control women and have them do his bidding. And given the fact that this was like from the 70s, writers of course had him assembling a harem of female slaves, many of which he's implied to have taken sexual advantage of. Pretty horrific stuff, for sure. So when EMH turns his character into a failure, an utter laughing stock, it's a gesture toward deflating this really problematic comic origin. And not just this, we see Wasp as the hero on the forefront, taking him down, sort of leading the squad in this attack. This scene then becomes in part a reclamation of female agency and a repudiation of the often deeply sexist and sexualized past of comic books. And of course, it bears mentioning that this episode is also great for the way it ties all this into the overarching serialized plot threads. There's the Enchantress stuff I mentioned earlier, but we also see T'Challa sneak into New York. And the Hulk's decision to leave at the end takes us straight into the discovery of Captain America. Granted, it's similar in the comics, but this version streamlines the process. And that crucial lesson about trust that I mentioned? Well, as the show gets into the secret invasion storyline, this foundational story is one that only becomes more relevant. But that's another story, for another time, and another video. Look, I want to be clear, this isn't me bashing the comics, this is me praising the show. Comic books and animation are two very different mediums. What works in one might not always work in the other, especially when you've got the benefit of decades of hindsight. The purpose of this, and the purpose of all of my Earth's Mightiest Heroes videos, is not to criticise other Marvel projects, just to talk about what makes this one so special and so unique. And it is really fun revisiting these comics and seeing all the 60s schmaltz, like Iron Man sat down with his chest plugged into the wall. So give them a read. And do you think they should have included this space phantom in this show? Let me know below. And if you like this, consider liking and subscribing. If you want more content like this, then that's the best way to let me know. Oh, and apropos of the point I made last video about MCU moments, which seem oddly familiar, let me leave you with this comparison. I do not fear your lightning, Odin son. Your magic is nothing against mine. You are not my target, witch. Armor energy reserves at 214%. Capacity. How about that? Alright, that's it. See you next time.